far. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 24. Come on, Mark. Come on, Come on, Mark. Come on. And uh, today we're going to talk about a better hope. A better right. hope. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 13, it says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but did not find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. That some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the pro that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to him to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they, to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began uh, to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned to, at once to Jerusalem. Uh, there they found the eleven along, uh, and those uh, along with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. What a great story. Amen. You know, this story teaches us about hope. We see here that without hope, without Jesus, hope is lost. Yeah. Yeah. We also see that, that the, uh, hope is restored when you realize that he's alive and real. Yeah. And his resurrection gives us a living hope that calms all of our troubles and our fears and our doubts. Yeah. You know, as I studied the story, I asked the question, why did Jesus choose to walk with these guys? Why was he going to Emmaus with them? Of all the things the resurrected Lord could have done, why join these guys on a walk to this village? You know, I believe as I looked at it, these men had lost hope and Jesus came to give them a better hope. Amen. Right. And they did get a better hope. I mean, we see drastic change in their disposition, in their outlook. Their countenance changed after spending time with the risen Lord. They went from being downcast to their hearts burning within them. Yeah. Talk about a switch flipping yeah, yeah. from hopeless to hopeful. Yeah. You know, and I was trying to think about a story to illustrate such a drastic change of emotion. just And how things just change from, from being hopeless to being hopeful. And Diana helped me think of this. Jimmy Kimmel does this thing that uh, where parents steal their candy. Check yeah. this out. Without further ado, the candy monster strikes again. Last night, we ate every bit of your Halloween candy.
a lot of Halloween candy. It's okay. Did you, did you, well, did you eat all of it? Don't tell me you ate all of it. <laughs> Hey guys, guess what? We're just kidding. All the candies are left in the laundry room. change of motions. Yeah. Cruel, but kind of awesome, amen? Yeah. Even like the, video, the kids in the video, the men had lost Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Their hopes and dreams were dashed. They had left everything for him, and he was gone. And they're dismayed and downcast. But a little bit of time with Jesus, and everything changed. Their hearts are burning with joy. Their hope had been restored. Jesus came and gave them a better hope. Amen? Amen. And Jesus is alive, as we just sang, and he gives us a better hope. Right. Something to believe in. He is alive. He appeared to these men who lost hope because he wanted them to have a better hope. And the story is in scripture because I believe God wants us to have a better hope. Yeah. Today, I hope this same transformation can occur in your life. That we can all realize there's something better out there. Let's dive into this story, amen? amen. The first thing you see as the story begins, they lost hope. When Jesus first walks with them, they were in a rough place. They were feeling all hope was lost. You know, you read what he, when he asked them, they stopped in their tracks. It says they stood still. And I can just imagine hearing the men tell this story. How have you not heard? I mean, this about Jesus. He was powerful, prophet, word, and deed. And then the chief priests, they arrested him. They sentenced him to death. And he was crucified. But we had hoped, we had hoped. Don't you hear the disappointment in their voice? We had hoped for redemption. We, were, we had hoped. They were disillusioned and disappointed. And the world today needs a better hope, amen? amen? Most are hopeless. Most are disappointed. Many feel let down by unrealized hopes and dreams. You know, I can relate to this. As a Dallas Cowboys fan and an Aggie fan, I have many seasons that ended like this, but we had hope. Des Bryant, that was a catch. <laughs> Sneaking Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Kenny Hill, man. Kenny Hill, right? Johnny Who, we got Kenny Thrill Hill. I mean, then he left us. You know, on vacation. And so you can have, as a sports fan, you can have hopes. On vacation, don't you get excited about vacation? You're like, I'm not going to work. I'm not going to call. Don't call me on vacation. I'm not going to return your text message. Thank you. But I'm off. I'm excited. There's excitement. This is going to be fun. And, and you go and you catch your first fish at the lake house that you're in for the week. And you're excited. And you eat dinner. And then a few hours later, your wife says, honey, come here. It's 10 o'clock at night. And she's got bug, uh, bed bug bites all on her stomach. That was our vacation this last year. <laughs> We had hoped for so much. And we got bed bugs, so Airbnb, thank you, amen? <laughs> you know, Halloween candy, vacations, sports, they're meaningless. There are real things that people are saying, but we had hoped. You know, I've, got, I've done a few weddings, about 30 or so, and 
Weddings are full of hope and excitement. So much excitement and, 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 and energy and usually pretty good. Sometimes you got a bridezilla kind of crazy, but you know, usually pretty good. But then you get to marriage. So weddings have full of hope. And then you talk to people about their marriage. Many are hopeless. Many, for many, divorce has become inevitable. At the birth of children, families celebrate. There's so excitement, so much excitement. You know, when we had our kids, we, we had showers and we got a flood of pink came into my house. All of a sudden, you know, I have three daughters. So a flood in pink every time, you know, my house is just overrun with baby dolls. It's crazy. <laughs> and there's so much excitement at the birth of a child. Yes. But as families grow, you and I know people who are estranged from one another. Their parents are so excited, they hold that little one, it's gonna be great, I'm gonna be close to you. But as time goes on, there's no hope in families and things happen, hurt feelings, somebody stepped on somebody's toes, I mean, you know, and, and there's no relationship. Hope is lost. You know, people work hard, they get degrees, they enter the career field, and inside they feel this aching feeling, is this as good as it gets? I think many of us can relate to this idea of lost hope. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I felt hopeless, confused. At times, I have lost hope. I believe all of us have made the choice to sin, whatever that may be. We're thinking this is going to be great. This is going to be exhilarating. It's going to provide meaning to my life. But we're left empty, disappointed, and shame that came along with the sin. The high never lasted that long. Friends were there for a good time, but now I'm alone. Feeling ashamed, and I don't know who to talk to about it. You know, we're all different. You look around, we're very different people. But one thing we all know is a feeling of loneliness and hopelessness. A feeling of, we had hoped. Like the two men, we are in need of a better hope, amen? Let me ask you, where are you today? Are you feeling hopeless or hopeful? Are you at the beginning of the story, but we had hoped? Or are you, your heart burning within you? You know, hope is a precious commodity. It's fragile. It can be stolen from us. Some here today are brimming with hope. Others have faced challenges. And our view of Jesus has become obstructed. You know, we live in a world that's so searching for something better. I mean, every advertisement, it's about better this, better that. They want something better. They want something to put their hope and trust in. People are longing for a better hope because they've lost hope. Some have lost hope in finding true satisfaction. Some have lost hope in ever finding a real friend. Others have lost hope in ever finding true and meaningful romance. Still others have lost hope in religion. We can say this is our world. Lost hope. And the story is really encouraging because it doesn't end there. Amen? Because no. Jesus goes to those who've lost hope and he gives them hope a better hope, he restores their hope. You know, these disciples had followed Jesus. Jesus is arrested and crucified, and they didn't understand. They had, they had lost where, uh, or were losing their hope. But one evening and one time with Jesus, their hope was restored. You know, and so I've asked, how did Jesus restore their hope? Was it when he appeared? And you look in verse 32, it says, while he talked with us, we're not our hearts burning while he talked with us on the road. And what? And opened the scriptures to us. They didn't point to his appearing. They pointed to when he, re or when he revealed himself. No, they pointed to when he opened the scriptures. Hope is restored when you open the Bible. Amen. Amen. You know, I asked this question as I was reading. I was like, why didn't Jesus right at the beginning go, hey, hey it's me. Why did he hide his identity? Other post-resurrection appearances, he just shows up. He reveals himself. He walks into the locked door. He says, here's my hand. And he showed up. 
You know, honestly, if this, this experience is what many people are waiting for. They're waiting for Jesus to show up and go on a walk with him, them, to reveal themselves and to have this experience. And if I have this experience, then I'll know God is real. Yeah. You know, others base their walk on God with just one experience they had. I had this one experience. I was there. I felt it. And I raised my hand. I did this. But it's a rare moment. And people go looking in their spiritual life, looking for one spiritual high after the other. Just looking, yearning for something more. People want a road to the Emmaus experience where Jesus will come down and walk with them. But let's look closer at what happened. You know, what did Cleopas and his buddy experience? They began walking in verse 13, but didn't realize it was Jesus until verse 31. He's there for just a moment, and then he disappeared. Most of the time, they didn't even know it was Jesus. They walked seven miles with a guy who knew the scriptures. That's all they knew. So I believe Jesus went incognito to show the power of the scriptures and the power of relationships. Because if you're waiting for that event, you know, the truth is events are great. Moments are awesome. But they can be doubted over time. Did that really happen? I mean, was that really Jesus or did he kind of just look like Jesus? I mean, it could be forgotten. It can be dismissed. But the scriptures stand forever. First Peter in verse in in the latter part of chapter one, it says the grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord stands forever. Jesus himself used the scriptures to explain the Messiah's suffering. Let me ask you, where do you get your hope? Hope is restored through opening the scriptures. Right. So how are you doing at opening the scriptures? We live in a day and age where you can get the Bible anywhere. You can download it. You can read it anytime. I mean, it's amazing how much access we have to the scriptures. That's right. Yeah. But how much do you read the Bible? Come on. Oh, Lord. Hope is restored through opening the scriptures. Look at Jesus' correction to these disciples. He says, how foolish you are. And slow of heart to believe what the prophets, all the prophets have spoken. You know, the truth is being slow to believe what the scriptures say robs us of our hope. Robs us of our hope. Some here today have no hope because you've let, you've you've taken your eyes off the scriptures. You stopped opening the word. You got to go to the scriptures to study all the scriptures concerning what Jesus said. A great challenge, some homework here. Can you do what Jesus did in verse 27? Beginning at Moses and all the prophets explain in all the scriptures concerning Jesus. Do you know your word? The Old Testament, it does matter. You can learn some great things there. If you want a better hope, start with the scriptures. Too many people don't have their own faith. They have a borrowed faith. They don't know the word. They don't know where the the chapters are. And it's okay if that's where you are. That's a good place to start. As long as you open it, you'll figure it out. You know, people rely on hearsay from others and haven't read or studied the Bible themselves. Listen to these guys' words. Worn out our hearts burning within us while he talked and opened the scriptures. Better hope begins with opening the Bible. Right. You must open the scriptures. Amen. Amen. You know, and he also, I think he did this because he shows us the power of one man helping another man. He was unknown to them. They didn't know it was Jesus, but they listened and were corrected. This story shows me that we don't need Jesus to come down and talk with us. But we do need people in our lives who will confront us and open the Bible with us and challenge our lack of faith. You know, do you have a good friend who opens the scriptures with you? Do you have a good friend that you could talk honestly about your marriage? I mean, the things you're really doing. Do you have a good friend that can help you and work with you? That you could say, hey, I got into this sin and I did this. I thought it was going to be fun, but I am disappointed. I am full of shame. How do I change? I feel like I stepped in glue and I can't get out of it. Right? We all have sin like that. Do you have a good friend that you could talk to about this? Do you have somebody that can help you? This story shows us the power of open Bibles and the power of good friends. Amen? Amen. 
Better hope begins with good friends and an open Bible. Yeah. Today, I want to invite you. Ask your friend, hey, can we open the scriptures together? Yeah. Can we go on a walk and you explain to me about who Jesus is? Let's have some of those talks this week, amen? amen. I want to invite you to open the Bible with your friends and help one another find hope in Jesus. Our hope can be restored. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter your baseline of, of knowledge. There are no prerequisites here. Yeah. You may not be able to get into maze, but you can know Jesus. Amen. <laughs> you can know Jesus. Our hope can be restored. Just a little bit of time with Jesus and their hope was restored. Amen. Yeah. They found out that they have a living hope. Look at how these men in verse 34, how different they are. They say it is true. The Lord has risen. Jesus is alive. Their hope was restored because they realized that hope is alive. Peter calls it a living hope. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 1. Good morning. Good morning. First Peter chapter one in verse three. Praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Amen. There's a lot of amazing parallels from chapter one of first Peter and uh, Luke 24, the story we just read. You know, he says we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have a living hope. One that never perishes, spoils, or fades. That's the type of inheritance we want, amen? I mean, don't you want a retirement fund that never perishes, spoils, or fades? Or a degree that never perishes, spoils, or fades? Something that's always powerful and you can always get a job? That'd be nice. Yeah. It's not like Bitcoin. It holds its value. <laughs> you know, Jesus is alive and nothing can diminish his life. Yeah. Nothing can diminish it. Nothing you ever experience, no sin you get into can ever diminish, spoil, or fade how amazing Jesus is. Yeah. Jesus is alive. Nothing can diminish his life. You know, in the news constantly, there are stories about people and their, their dirty secrets are brought into light. They're shown as evil. You know, Columbus Day is now Indigenous People Day, right? And he did some horrible things that have been hidden for centuries. Very few people have truly have a life admirable. It seems like everybody, you're like, oh, that guy is, oh, he did that. And people have tried forever to do that to Jesus, but they can't. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 6, in talking about Jesus, no one can throw shade on Jesus. It says, one who has become a priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. Verse 19, for the law made nothing per perfect. A better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. The author of Hebrews here, it's a, I'll try to summarize, it's a, it's a deep, rich study. But the author of Hebrews is trying to make a convincing argument that Jesus is greater than the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. That he's better, he's the better high priest. 
And it says here he's better because he has an indestructible life. Indestructible. We can have a better hope because Jesus is never going to diminish. There's no skeleton in the closet that's going to come out about Jesus. They've already tried and failed. Jesus is the living hope. He's alive and he's real. He can never perish, spoil, or fade because he is alive and has an indestructible life. Therefore, verse 13, we should set our what? Our hope on the grace to be revealed. We should set our hope on the grace to be revealed. You know, you remember back in Luke, the disciples said, but we had hoped that he was going to redeem Israel. And in verse 18, Peter describes our redemption beautifully. Jesus did redeem us. It wasn't with perishable things such as silver, but through his precious blood. You know, we can have a better hope. And some of the things that makes it, one of the greatest things that makes it better is we are redeemed. Yeah. Yeah. That means purchased. He gave his blood to purchase us. He redeemed us. Yeah. It says we're redeemed from the empty way of life. You know, and I look at our world and the way of life that most Americans, most people, you know, maybe in my perspective, middle class, look at is, you know, let's get good job, make a lot of money, so that I can have a bigger couch and a bigger TV. And let's eat all the kind of crazy things that, you know, fried everything. Let's just eat it all. Because I want to be comfortable, I want to be a glutton, and I want to be lazy, right? That's, that's what people are going for. I mean, if you, if you look at all the material things, all they offer you, I mean, the chairs and cars now these days, it's crazy the advertisement for a chair in the car. It's like, wow, that's a lot for a chair. <laughs> All that we have everything in our hands. We just want to be comfortable. That's empty. Yeah. It's empty. Because eventually your phone's not going to work. Eventually that TV is going to be too small and you got to jump up to the 70 inch, brother. I mean, that's the, honey, we need a 70 inch. You know? So I haven't got one. Um, but we just ask for these things of comfort and material things. It's empty. Yeah. Yeah. It's empty. Or you look at the sin we go after and the things people dive into. Millions upon millions of dollars are spent every day on pornography. That's empty. That's shallow. It's not real. It's destroying people. It's an empty way of life. Jesus redeemed us from it. He said empty way of life, what? Handed down from generation to generation. You know, there's this concept of generational sin. And you may have done this before. You can look at your family. You can look in scriptures and you can see that guy was a liar. His son was a liar. His grandson was a liar. I mean, there's this study of generational sin. And you may look at your family and go, yep, granddad was angry. Dad was angry. I'm angry. But, you know, and you could see generational sin. It's kind of a discouraging study, but you could see it. <laughs> And the thing is, is that you can break the chain of generational dysfunction. Amen. You may look at your chain, your family lineage, and go divorce, alcoholism, addiction, 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 divorce. And you may get discouraged. What hope is there? We were redeemed from the empty way of life Amen. handed down to us from our ancestors. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus not only takes away our sin, he gives us something to live for. We are redeemed. Amen. Our hope is better because our redemption is amazing. Right. Right. And then in verse 21, he says, our faith and hope are what? In God. Yeah. Not in this world. Not in the size of our bank account. Not in the comfort of our couch. It's in God. Right. We have so much more to live for. You know, today I want to encourage you, Jesus is risen. We have a better hope, a living hope that can never fade. As we close, look back over in Luke chapter 24. It says, while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, said to them, peace be with you. 
They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed himself, he showed them his hands and his feet. You know, I, I love the question that Jesus asked. Why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your mind? I want to be like, Jesus, you were dead. I mean, like, I'd be kind of freaked out here. You know what I mean? Like, you were dead, okay? We saw, we saw the tomb. I mean, we were there. You got arrested. I mean, we're a little, this is kind of new for us. This may be not new for you, but this is new for us. But in a bigger picture, I think this is a great question to ask us when we get hopeless. Why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your mind? Jesus says to them, look at my hands. Touch me and see that I'm alive. Jesus wasn't the only thing that came out of the tomb. He brought our hope with him. And so as Jesus points to the resurrection as reason to have hope, as reason to, to quiet our troubled minds and uh, still all of our doubts. You know, and these are great, great questions to meditate on. Yeah. As you face challenges in your life, as you feel things are hopeless, why are you troubled? Look at the risen Lord. Right. Look at my hand and touch them. Why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my feet. Touch them. If Jesus is alive, he takes away our sin. He takes away our trouble. He takes away our doubts. If Jesus is alive and he defeated Satan, what else can happen to us? Yeah. Why doubt Jesus won? Amen. I want to encourage you today. The resurrection gives us a better hope, a living hope, one that does not disappoint. In Hebrews, it says a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Today, I want to invite you. We have a better hope so that we can draw near to God. I want to encourage you, draw nearer to God. Make a decision. You may have lost hope. It can be restored. Open the scriptures with a friend. Find out more about the living hope. Jesus is alive and he wants us to have a better hope. Amen. Amen. Amen.